Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to our tafsir class. We are doing the kitab known as Al-Jami'u li Ahkam al-Qur'an of Imam al-Qurtubi rahimahullah which is more famously known as Tafsir al-Qurtubi. Now we are doing the tafsir of Surah Abasa wa Tawalla and we had gotten into it a couple of weeks back. We're still busy with the surah because for some reason I always tend to take longer than what is uh, required. But anyway, so we are here. As you can see, if you're following along, I hope the screen is showing anyway. So you this is where we had stopped last week. So it is from this point that we are continuing on from tonight, inshallah. As is uh, the, the norm, when it comes to the qira'at, the poetry, and the over uh, the top uh, Arabic explanations, those type of things I tend to skip. Otherwise, you know, uh, translating high-end Arabic, uh, minuscule differences between the things if you do not understand the Arabic, you know, what when you're talking about the Dhamir and the, you know, a khafd and the dust and that, it goes over the head of the normal person. And the whole purpose of these classes is to make it so that anyone and everyone can can attend any random class at any point in time in the middle of a class and still be able to understand what's going on. So anyhow, let's uh, continue. Anyway, and one point to say, like I always tend to forget to say at the beginning, is that if at any point in time during the class you have any questions with regards to anything, you're more than welcome to ask your question right there and then. You do not have to wait until the ending of the class before asking a question. So no matter how many times it is, no matter how many questions it is, you're more than welcome at all points. إذا تسمى لي تبين بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه. So he says قوله تعالى أن صببنا الماء صبا. He says قراءة العامة the قراءة of the majority. So as is the normal Imam Al Qurtubi he focuses mainly on two things as you can notice through a lot of the tafsir that we've done thus far. He focuses a lot on the قراءات the Ten qiraat as well as the other qiraat that are shad, you know, the uh, the non-accepted qiraat, to put it in such terms. In other words, qiraat that you may not even, uh, you, that you at least I should say, that you aren't permitted to recite the Qur'an as, even those ones you would touch upon. So anyway, so... He says, "Qira'at al-Ama inna bil kasri al istinaf." Now, as we know, istinaf here, if we do it in Arabic in a madrasa perspective. But anyway, so how they would recite this ayah is that inna sababun al ma asaba. But we know we recite it as anna sababun al ma asaba. So according to the different qira'at, the ayah is read in different different ways. So he says, "Waqra al kufiyun wa rawis an yaqub anna bi fath al hamza, fa anna fi mawdi khafd ala tarjumati an al taam, fa wa badal minhu, ka anna wqala, fa liyanzir al insan ila taami, ila anna sababna." فلا يحسن الوقف على طعامه من هذه القراءة وكذلك إن رفعت أنا بإضمار هو أنا صببنا لأنها في حال رفعها مترجمة عن الطعام وقيل المعنى لأن صببنا الماء فأخرجنا به الطعام أي كذلك كان so to summarize the difference, you see what happens is the differences in the qiraat, when you read it as inna or anna, I mean, if you look from an Arabic perspective, inna, anna, words like this, little changes makes differences at the end of the day. So the Quran, and one thing I'll point out once again, is that all of the qiraat, the, when we talk about the accepted qiraat of the Quran, every single one of them are mutawatir. It's not that some imam came along and he decided to read this way. No. If any imam happened to have a particular way, he would be branded a kafir because it's not your choice. Okay, I want to read it this way or not. Every single one of these ways of recitation are in a mutawatir form. Those which are not mutawatir, they are regarded as being, you know, the unaccepted ones because it didn't reach us in a mutawatir form. And that's how preserved the Quran is. So when we say anna or this or that, then it is because every one of these ways are reported. And you know what is mutawatir? The, tawa the definition of tawatir in the Sharia terms is uh, such a narration that comes from so many different people. You know, uh, to use uh, it's similar like how the rain comes down. So many drops that are 
not linked to one another, but it comes from that same one source of the cloud. So the, there are so many different people narrating it that it's impossible a group is narrating from another group like that, that it's impossible all of them could have conspired to make up something. That is the level of Tawatur. That is the level that these the different Qira'at are upon. Meaning that for every one of these Qira'at, all 10 forms, every one of those forms was recited in that way by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Not that some imam so and so or imam this year or the 10 uh, 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 qurra or, or you know that they read it in this way no every one of these forms came directly from rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam which came ultimately all from allah so anyway so when you're looking at the different qiraat and from a linguistic perspective slight difference uh, with a fatha and a kasra in this case here of anna and inna but he says if you look at the difference what would he mean if you're looking at anna he says ila and, uh, uh, you know at the ayat continues on so let man look at his food that how allah has sent the the rain down you know, and the ayat continues on. That's if you're looking at it, translating it from Anna. But he says, if you're using it in the other way, he says here, لِأَنَّا بِهِ Because Allah has sent down the rain, on account of the rain, Allah causes the food, the, 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 the food to come out of the ground as a result of it, which we did, you know, in last week's class about the earth breaking open and the seed coming out and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, it's, He's focusing about on the linguistics, on what the slight differences come about as a result of the various qira'at. He says, وَقَرَأَ الْحُسَيْنِ بْنِ عَلِي أَنَّا or أَنِّي One point I'll point out, as I always say, is that my field is not qira'at. I am not aware of the recitations of all the qura, so I, will, I do not extend myself beyond my capabilities. So what the actual qira'at, and this is one thing I always say, is, uh, I've mentioned it in the past as well, that when you see qira'at being mentioned here, don't think, okay, it says inna, so it's okay, it's all fine and good, I can try and read this inna. No. Like I mentioned, Imam al-Qurtubi, uh, we did this in one of our early uh, classes, I think it was in Surah Naba, uh, where uh, Imam al qurtubi quoted a particular recitation way, but that one was amongst the Shad Qira'at. In other words, which meant that it would not be permissible for you to perform Salah reading in that manner. Your Salah would not be valid. That's how serious it is. So I always say the purpose here is for us to increase our knowledge, not for a person to take something and run with it without understanding. Every aspect and every field of the deen is deep in its own right. And, you know, it doesn't befit a person who's studying the deen to grab something and just run with it. You study something and when you've understood it and you've, that you've studied it under somebody and that person has confirmed that, yes, you have understood it. Hence, they give you ijaza. You've got... Uh, permission that yes you understand this matter then yes by all means you can go and read and things and that's why people who have studied the qiraat they have their asani the chains of narration which links them up right up all the way to nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam so anyway what i'm simply pointing out here is that my field is not qira'a, so I cannot tell you which one is necessarily a shad and not. There was one of my friends who was attending one of the classes, he still pointed it out that this particular one is from the shad qira'at. So that's why I simply put out a disclaimer that do not think that just because it's mentioned in Tafsir al-Qurtubi that Imam al-Qurtubi is saying it's all good. Imam al-Qurtubi is simply adding all the various viewpoints and things that is out there, not telling you, go out and do this or do that. So be that as it may. So he was saying here yeah, that this recitation in this way is بِمَعْنَا كَيْفَ كَيْفَ صَبَبْنَا الْمَاءَ You know, like this, أَنَّا صَبَبْنَا الْمَاءَ صَبَّ If you were to take it in this meaning, it would then be, do you, does, does man not see how we have sent down the rain in torrents? If you were to see the slight differences in the uh, the qira'at, what he brings about from a translation perspective. So he says, فَمَنْ أَخَذَ بِهَذِهِ الْقِرَاءَةِ قَالَ الْوَقْفُ عَلَى طَعَامِهِ تَامٌ وَيُقَالُ مَعْنَا أَنَّا أَيْنَا إِلَى أَنَّا فِي إِنْ أَنَّا فِيهَا كِنَايَةٌ عَنِ الْوُجُوهِ وَتَأْوِيلُهَا مِنْ أَيِّ وَجْهٍ صَبَبْنَا الْمَاءِ قَالَ الْكُمَيْتِ أَنَّا وَمِنْ أَيْنَا آبَكَ الْمَطْرَبُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا صَبْوَةٌ وَلَا رِيبُ Okay, so I'm going to skip the poem, like I said. But anyway, so he, what is the point of the waqf? 
for the waqf is we're talking about the ending of the ayah ending of the ayah so فَلْيَنْظُرِ الْإِنسَانُ إِلَىٰ طَعَامِهِ Waqf, you know, we're stopping at that point. So he says that when you understand the ayah in this context that how Allah has sent down the rain, when you take it with that uh, translation, then yes, uh, the which is not a translation per se, it's from the words itself. So these Qur'an, they say, sure, no problem if you stop at ila uh, ta'ami, because it's the end of a sentence, so to speak. Others would say, no, 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 no. Uh, when you are reading it in, uh, uh, you know, for example, where we go, yeah. So he says, he says, uh, we, we had passed it on this point here. He says, so if you are taking it here, uh, he says, so in this, as these Qurra, they said that, you know, stopping at uh, an ta'ami isn't the best form. You know, it's not like I wouldn't say it's not right, but you know, it's like not the best thing. Whereas these other ones, they say it's done, it's complete, hundred uh, percent. Different things from the point of the qiraat. But anyway, let's uh, jump on to the tafsir itself. So he left out the word anna. It starts sababna al ma'asaba, yani al ghayth wal amtar. That Allah sends down the rain. Matar and Ghayth both are translated if you were to open a dictionary as rain. Obviously, when you get down into the high uh, level Arabic dictionaries and you look at what's the difference between Ghayth and what's the difference between Matar, you'll see uh, slight differences from that aspect. But generally, uh, people would use it, so to say, as uh, interchangeable terms. The difference you would see, for example, in Ghayth is that it's always a beneficial rain, so to speak. Whereas matar can have a harmful effects uh, to it too. Whereas, let me give you an example. Uh, you may have heard the term Ghoth, you know, Ghothi Park. And, you know, if you are uh, from amongst people where they talk uh, the Ghoth and Madad Abu Dhul Qadr and all things of this sort, you may have heard this term Ghoth. Ghoth is from the same root, which means like something which helps, which benefits. So Ghayth is that rain which has a beneficial quality to it. Same applies to Rawh and Rih when you're talking about winds. But anyway, we're not delving too much on linguistics tonight. So anyway, Then Allah causes the earth to split, a splitting. A bin Nabat. فَأَنْبَتْنَا فِيهَا حَبَّا أَيْ قَمْحًا وَشَعِيرًا وَسُوطًا وَسَائِرَ مَا يُحْصَلُ وَيُدَّخَرْ وَعِنَبًا وَقَضْبًا وَهُوَ الْقَدْتُ وَالْعَلَفْ عن الحسن سمي بذلك لأنه يقضب أي يقطع بعد ظهوره مرة بعد مرة قاله القطبي وثعلب وأهل مكة يسمون القطة القضب Okay, so Allah says that Allah causes the earth to split open How does it split open and what is the splitting open? It is the splitting open by the crops which grows out from it And that is what we had actually touched upon in the tafsir when we did do the uh, interim translation, you know, that Allah causes the the uh, the grain to grow in it. Allah causes the seed to split. And we spoke uh, uh, unnecessarily over, over the time last time on, uh, you know, all the growth and growth and growth and different types of grass and uh, plants and trees and everything of that sort. But anyway, so he's saying here that uh, wheat and barley and all the different types of plants, all of everything, all of these seeds, all these grain, Allah causes to grow from the earth by splitting the thing. And like I said last time, any seed you're going to put inside the ground, it the seed splits open and a plant comes out. And in that manner, that's how Allah splits the earth. It doesn't mean, you know, a sinkhole type splitting. No, it's referring to the splitting that happens with the seed and a plant comes out, and that plant is the food that you eat, not the the pick and pay and spa type food that people tend to think, but everything comes from that point of the ground. So uh, everything, all types of uh, things that you plant in, in the ground. So whether you're going to be planting your carrots, your uh, beetroot, your... Uh, chilies, your dania, whatever it may be, anything you're going to plant, all of this is included in this ayah of shaqaqna al-arda shaqa, that Allah splits the earth by causing that plant to grow.
And in that next ayah wherein Allah has spoken about that Allah causes also grapes and herbage. All the, and like I said, herbage applies to all the different types of things. Like I said, whether you want to call it your rocket, your uh, celery, your spinach, your, your, or whatever type of herbs you want to call, or, or you want to say your danias are herbs, whatever the case may be, all of it is being included because nobody else is making it besides Allah in the first place. So obviously, but anyway, that is qadb. So uh, oh, he says, what is qadb? He says, يُقْطَعُ بَعْدَ ظُهُورِ مَرَّةً بَعْدَ مَرَّةً It is such a plant which is cut down time after time. In other words, you will have a, your uh, a dania which grows, and you snap, and later on it grows, and you cut some more, and you have your curry leaves, and you cut your curry leaves, and then you have your uh, spinach, and your spinach grow, and you cut some off, and next time it grows back up, marratan ba'da marra, it grows, you cut, it grows again, you know, you don't have to throw another seed in, but it grows from that same thing which has le been left behind, that piece of plant that is left over, Allah causes it to grow again. So that is the qadb that is being spoken about in the ayah. Any case, so moving on. So you have Hadrat Abdullah ibn Abbas with an opinion over here. He says that uh, he translated it over here as being uh, dates, which he says here is we are here. Uh, a rutab. Now, um, most people tend to look at rutab as being a type of date, you know, uh, come along uh, Ramadan time, and then you've got your sukkari, and you've got your khudri, you've got your safawi, you, you know, your, your medjool, different types of dates. So people tend to see rutab at that time. Rutab actually is not a type of date. Rutab means a fresh date. So you had two types of date. You've got a tamar and you've got a rutab. Tamar would refer now to a dry date. So your safawis and all of those khudris and all those types are regarded as dry dates. Whereas the uh, rutab are those which are fresh. And it was the habit of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to first go for a rutab before a uh, Tamar, you know, for the wet date before the dry date. Now, if you have seen uh, date markets and stuff like this here in Medina and so on, you would have seen the tables laden. I don't know how it is. In fact, I don't know. I've never been to Medina in the first place. But if you've seen pictures of what the markets tend to look like, those tables and all that sort of stuff, you've seen the green dates, the yellowish uh, dates, you know, those, they soft, they like a Big fat grape in the first place, so juicy they are. So those are referred to as rutab. It's not a specific, like a medjool type thing. It's a, the, all those dates which are fresh are referred to as rutab. So he's saying uh, in this ayah, uh, the qadab refers to rutab because prior to this, he's saying, so Allah is referring to, day, uh, to grapes and rutab dates. In other words, Soft, fresh, soft, fresh, that sort of thing. That, that was one opinion uh, uh, from Hadrat Abdullah ibn Abbas. Uh, يبست فهو قط وقال والقضب اسم يقع على ما يقضب من أغصان الشجرة ليتخذ منها سهام أو قسي. Okay, so different different opinions. At the end of the day, we will say whichever. And I always tend to go for this viewpoint that the ayah is broad. Allah didn't tell us dates. Allah didn't tell us uh, a plant. Allah said. Qadr. And whatever qadr can be referred to, we say all of that. We accept it all. So whether Ahl Makkah say it refers to this, or as you can see here, it is ma yuqdabu min aghsani shajara, that which you cut from the branches of the trees, so you can take, uh, or at least I should say, that you make bow, the bow and the arrows out of that branches. So all of that also included in the meaning of this ayah because the ayah is broad in meaning we may look upon it uh, you know what a uh, 
let's put it this way, a, we give a small meaning to it in order for us to be able to understand it and to give a simple translation. So I went with herbage, you know, when we did the translation. But it's not limited just to that. Whatever it can refer to, we say, so be it. The ayah is broad and we'll say it applies to every one of those things. وَيُقَالُوا قَضْبَ بِمَعْنَى جَمِيعَ مَا يُقْضَبُ مثل القط والكراث وسائر البقول التي تقطع فينبت أصلها This is similar to what was just mentioned again earlier uh, just in uh, different terms now everything which is cut meaning that all those uh, uh, بقول you know yeah, this isn't broccoli but uh, you know uh, uh, it's like what the Jews ask for مِنْ بَقْلِهَا وَقِسَائِهَا وَفُومِهَا وَعَدَسِهَا وَبَصَلِهَا uh, it refers to those things which are cut and it grows again uh, from the roots so like I explained, you cut your uh, celery, you cut your uh, spinach, and from that same roots, more grows. So this is says, another opinion says, this is what Qadba uh, in the ayah refers to. وفي الصحاح والقضبة والقضب الرطبة وهي الاستف استفست بالفارسية والموضع التي تنبت فيه مقضبة. Okay. So in, in uh, Sihah, it's mentioned the, 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 that Walqadbu, uh, Walqadbatu is that which is, uh, you know, like you can say, a wet thing. Now, is feast, unfortunately, I don't know Farsi, uh, so I can't say what exactly the, the is feast is in Farsi. Otherwise, um, if I knew the language, I would be able to help better over there. But anyway, the the place where it grows is known as Maqadwa. He's speaking now uh, from a linguistic perspective, hence why he's quoting from a dictionary. But anyway, let's move on. وزيتون وهي شجرة الزيتون ونخلة يعني النخيل وحدائق أي بساتين واحدها حديقة قال الكلب وكل شيء وحيط عليه من نخيل أو شجر فهو حديقة وما لم يحط عليه فليس بحديقة. So carrying on وزيتون ونح ونخلة وحدائق غلبة. You know as the ayah continues on. So he says and Allah is telling us now about all the different things that Allah causes to grow. زيتون which is the olive tree. ونخل which is a نخيل. You know the the date palm so to speak. وحدائق and Hadaiq uh, is plural of the word hadiqa, which means basatin, bustan for singular, which means gardens. Wahid wa hadiqatun, singular form is hadiqa. Imam al Qalbi said that everything which is surrounded, in other words, it, uh, let's put it this way, on the border of the, the property is uh, the date palms or, or some sort of tree, then that is known as a hadiqa. You use a hadiqa in that. Uh, say, uh, context but if you have a property and it's not uh let's put it this way the boundary is not trees then in that case it's not referred to as a hadiqa so you may be having a garden but it's not a hadiqa you'd use a different word now to describe it so if you look at it let's, let's put it this way you've got a piece of land you've got your house over there and your boundary is all trees going around like that right around then you'd say, yes, or even on your property, you've got a small uh, inner sector where your trees are planted and maybe you've got other plants in the center, but there's a, a, a boundary of trees that is then referred to as a hadiqa. غلبة إذا عظاما شجرها يقال شجرة غلبة ويقال للأسد الأغلب لأنه مصمة العنق لا لا يلتفت إلا جميعا قال العجاج ما زلت يوم البين يوم البين ألوي صلبي والرأس حتى صرت مثل الأغلب والرجل أغلب بين الغلب إذا كان غليظ رقبة والأصل في الوصف بالغلب الرقاب فاستعيره قال عمرو بن معدي كريب رضي الله عنه يمشي بها غلب الرقاب كأنهم بزل كسين من الكحيل جلالا Okay, let me read the last piece anyway before our time runs out وحديقة غلباء مل تفة وحدائق غلب وغلولب وغلولب العشب بلغه والتفت البعض بالبعض قال ابن عباس الغلب جمع أغلب وغلبا وهي الغلاب وعنه أيضا الطوال قتادة وابن زيد الغلب النخل الكرام وعن ابن زيد, ابن زيد أيضا وعكرمة عظام الأوساط والجذوع مجاهد ملتفة okay. All of this Oh, he's just trying to explain what is the meaning of وحدائق غلبة. So, 
you know, when we had done the brief translation, I had translated it as the, the gardens which are dense. Uh, you know, it's got the trees and plants and shrubs and stuff in it is dense. So the tafsir, all of it here is basically just trying to prove that same thing. It's trees are big. Uh, or you can say, uh, as you look at the, we skipping the examples of, of the lion because the lion turns its whole head. You, if you can say, yeah, uh, uh, that they are like the simple terms. You know, if one is going into the other one, it's so close they are. We use the simple terms, we call it dense. So, uh, Another one is غلاظ, it is thick, uh, you know, uh, الكرام, you know, like big, full uh, uh, date uh, palms. All at the end of the day is coming down to the same thing. It's a lot of different viewpoints saying a lot of different things, which can all be uh, encompassed in the word by saying it is dense. So, you know, it's got big... Uh, trunks, branches, things like this. It's big at the end of the day. That's why I said, you know, if you summarize everything, it comes to the same point that it is thick, dense, shrubbery, big uh, trees, you know, everything like this here. All of this is what Allah has uh, put on earth for people. We've got a couple of seconds left. So let's see if we can do this. Is this the next? Uh, yeah, okay. Okay, we won't definitely will not reach that far. And it's two whole pages. Okay. Let's move on. Let's read at least one more small paragraph before time runs out. He says, It says, Yes, the Arabs said that the Arabs so anyway, when Allah says what is fakiha? He says to make a distinction, fakiha refers to those fruits and things which come from the trees that human beings eat. You know, uh, you know, all your olives, your peaches, your apples, your pears, your bananas, all those sort of things are referred to as fakiha. Fakihat to use the plural form. So Allah is telling us that Allah made Fakihato wa Abba and Ab as well. Now, what is Ab? This is not Ab as in Abun, as in uh, Abu, you know, father, but this is uh, same word written in that form, but it refers to something else. He says, it re Abba in this ayah refers to the plants, the, let's put it this way, the greenery that animals eat. So the animals eat the grass and the hay and, you know, all those sort of things. Uh, you'll have certain uh, animals, horses or whatever, and you'll see they'll eat from the, le the leaves of the tree. Human beings won't eat the leaves. We'll eat the apple, but we're not going to eat the leaves. But the animal will come in and it will eat the leaves again. So Allah made both of this. Allah made the fruits for us and Allah even made that there is greenery and things for the animals to eat so that each one the animals, why once again? The animals are there that Allah has created it for the purpose of mankind to benefit from. So Allah gave its own food for the animals so that mankind has like a double source of food. The animals, which will eat other things that mankind don't eat, and the human beings will have their own fruit from the trees. So they'll have their fruit and they'll have the animals which will be fattened by the fruit, with, or at least by the greenery which they, they don't eat. So animals have got one source of food and human beings have got two sources of food, the fruit plus those animals which did not eat the fruit that human beings eat. Even though give a horse a, 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 an apple and you eat it too, but you know, it's not like the primary source of food. Sure, you can uh, give your cat a bowl of rice and it will sit there and eat it up, but you know, like, uh, Cats are, are not uh, there waiting for a bowl of rice at the end of the day or sitting with a plate of biryani, but give it to him and he'll probably eat it all up. But that's how it is. Allah has created food for them and food for mankind, and they're not exactly one and the same thing. So anyway, 
he quoted now the poem in the praise of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, وَقِيلَ إِنَّمَا سُمِّيَ أَبَّنْ لِأَنَّهُ يُعَبُّ أَيَّ أُمُّ وَيُنْتَجَعْ وَالْأُبُّ وَالْأُمُّ أَخَوَانِ قَالَ جِذْمُنَا قَيْسٌ وَنَجْدٌ دَارُنَا وَلَنَا الْأُبُّ بِهَا وَالْمَكْرَعُ Okay, وَقَالَ الضَّحَاكَ الْأُبُّ كُلُّ شَيْءٍ يَنْبُتُ عَلَى وَجْهِ الْأَرْضِ كَذَا قَالَ أَبُوْ رَزِينَ هُوَ النَّبَاتِ يَدُلُّ عَلَيْهِ قَوْلُ بْنِ عَبَّاسِ قَالَ الْأُبُّ مَا تُنْبِتُ الْأَرْضُ مِمَّا يَأْكُلُ النَّاسُ how do you determine that which we eat regularly is halal? Okay, very detailed uh, uh, question in great depth that requires um, simple terms. I'll give you uh, the principle of the Sharia. There are three principles of the Sharia when it comes to things of this nature. Al aslu fil ashia il ibaha. Al aslu fil ibadat il hadar or at tawakuf. Al aslu fil nikahi wa wa lahmi at tawakuf. Or al uh, hadaru, uh, different uh, words Fuqaha have used. So the, keep these three principles in mind, and things are rather simple and straightforward. When it comes to matters of deen, by default everything is prohibited until proven otherwise. How do we do this? Because when you make up something new in deen, it's known as what? An innovation. Hence, in order to say I can do this or I can't do that from a dini perspective, we need to have proof. It was done by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Sahaba radhiyallahu anhu. You know, there's some proof in the Sharia for it. Hence, why you prove it from the aspect that is aslu fil ibadat matters of deen. The second is al aslu fil ashia. This is a famous principle. Uh, most people will have heard of it. The asal with regards to things is permissibility. What does it refer to? You come into a, a forest, you see some new uh, uh, fruit on the tree, for example, dragon fruit, for example, you've never seen it before. So you take it. Is it permissible to eat or not? It's permissible. It's one of those things that are out there. It's a, it's a, it's a fruit. The Sharia hasn't made any fruit haram, so therefore it's permissible. So, you know, that's how it goes. And the last principle is the asal with regards to nikah and with regards to uh, meat is that it is haram until proven otherwise. What does this mean? It means that the Sharia has permitted us only to marry Muslims. And hence why you needed an ayah to stipulate and say Ahlul Kitab, which like we say, there is no Ahlul Kitab today. So therefore that part of the ayah does not apply because if the ayah spoke about uh, permissibility of eating dinosaurs and there are no dinosaurs, then, you know, as the principal states, you know, so anyway, before I, before our time runs out, just to uh, simplify matters, that when it comes to meat, by default, meat is haram until it's proven otherwise. In other words, what does it mean? You come and you find a, a packet of meat laying on the side of the road. Can you eat it? The Sharia says no. Is it carrion? Was it slaughtered by a Muslim? If it's something that's sacrificed to an idol, etc., etc., etc. So by default, it's haram. You need to prove that it's halal. That's how it works. Hence why you cannot eat meat by just anybody. Go into some mushrik's house and eat there. Go to McDonald's and Rocco Mama's and, you know, wherever you want to go to and just eat. No, you have to make certain that everything there is halal, the meat that you are eating. Otherwise, you can't. That's the, the general principles. Keep those things in mind and a lot of things become clear. Now you come to us, uh, a, uh, the modern world where your brush that you base things with can be with pork bris uh, ball bristles. Your sauce can have uh, donkey hair in it. You know, you can have the glands of monkeys. Monkey gland don't have glands of monkeys, but I'm making an example. So you can have all sorts of things in a spice, in a sauce, in a thing like this here. So therefore, in today's world, it has become a lot more necessary to know what it is that is going in. So while a person may say that the group such as uh, Sana, you know, they have a lot of uh, flaws, but at the same time, they do also do a lot of good in the sense that if you know uh, they have the ability to get information from the companies that they'll say, these are the things that go inside it. So therefore you can tell that, yes, this is permissible, that is not permissible, that got bull bristles, they base that with lard, you know, and things like this here. Hence you can tell from that angle. But anyway, the point being that how do we determine that what we eat regularly is halal? That is something Allah says, 
you know, Allah commanded the Anbiya, كُلُوا مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَعْمَلُوا صَالِحَا Eat from the tayyibat, the pure, wholesome, halal things. When the Ashabi Kahaf woke up after so many years and they sent one down to the town, he said, go look for what is the most, uh, like the halal, tayyib, proper, wholesome food. That's what you must go and fetch. So the point is that it is everyone's individual duty. It is fard ayn, if I were to use these terms. It is fard ayn, an individual obligation to make certain that what goes into your stomach is halal. It's not, you know, some people think, I'll go and I'll eat all over the place, and if it's pig that I'm eating, if it's uh, kangaroo hearts and stuff, I'm going to say, well, it was the MJC's fault, and, you know, I just said, Bismillah, and I ate it. It's not going to count in the court of Allah, because Allah gave you that command to look after yourself, what goes into your stomach. Uh, no one will carry the burden of, a, burden of another person. On that day, you will answer for yourself. What went into your stomach? What effort did you make to make certain that what you are eating is halal? Now, I'll end off with one point here to say, do not become extreme. That now you go to the point where you get like OCD, extra waswasa, is this halal? You know, is that apple? Could they maybe have wrapped the apple in a plastic and that plastic could have been used by somebody who blew his nose and he, you don't go to the extremes like that. You keep to what is the middle path. Once again, Islam is always on the middle path. You uh, do your best to uh, uh, attain that which is halal, to eat what is halal and everything of the sort. If you have tried your best, keeping in mind what the Sharia asks of you, what is over and above? I mean, if you come to somebody's house and somebody, a Muslim, and he's feed, fed you food and things, and later on you found out that he actually went and just gambled now by the casino and won a lot of money, and as a result of that, he bought this food here now. Allah will not thank you to task for it. He will be sinful, but you won't be. So there is the, what is what in your power, that's what you must do. What is outside of your power, that Allah will not take you to task for. Uh, in the story comes to mind. Somebody asked Hadar Ali radiallahu anhu, uh, authenticity of the story, reference for the story, I don't know, don't, uh, I haven't checked it, but it's a famous story. Uh, somebody came to Hadar Ali radiallahu anhu and asked him, how do I know what is in my control and what is in uh, Allah's control? Or at least what is in my power and what is in Allah's power? So Hadar Ali radiallahu anhu, according to the story, told the man, lift up your one leg. So he lifted it up. Then Hadar Ali radiallahu anhu told him, lift up the other leg. So the man said, I cannot do so. So Hadar Ali radiallahu anhu told him, for you to be able to lift up your one leg, that is what in your power. For you to lift up both legs, at the same time and in other words not fall over that is in the control of Allah so do what is within your power and then everything else will be fine unfortunately we've got a couple of seconds only left so uh, unfortunately we won't even be able to finish further but uh, any case we stopped on this point here that it is everything which grows from the earth that is what is known as wa'amba and until next time we end and we say wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina muhammad subhanallahi wa bihamdihi subhanaka allahumma wa bihamdik nashid wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh